When I was looking at uh, Dick's background, uh, one of the things that caught my attention was that I was, I was wondering, 1965, he graduated from graduate school in the University of Colorado. And I was wondering, would he has, have imagined that uh, more than two and a half decades later alone that he would join NASA Goddard and working here? And, and of course, 10 years later, or 11 years later, he would head the heliophysics division at NASA headquarters. Would he have imagined that journey? So today, he is going to walk us through that journey, a very exciting journey. And obviously, his title is very inspiring, The Seven Cycle. You know, what he needed to know from the Japanese garden or something like that. So it must be very exciting, and I'm looking forward to it. So please, with those few remarks, Help me welcome Richard Fisher. When uh, I was a boy in Kansas, I was occasionally taken to a museum in a big city. My parents did this when they were traveling on business. And it was just heaven. Dinosaurs, Egypt, astronomy. And by the time I was 10, I knew that I wanted to be in science. Now this is a longitudinal average uh, presented on a monthly basis of sunspot number as a function of latitude over time. And this is called the Maunder butterfly diagram. And it basically describes the magnetic variability of the sun, although this is a completely non-physical measurement of magnetism. It's just, it's just a count of sunspots. So uh, this, this diagram, beginning in 1940 and ending sort of at the present, covers the period of time I talk. Now, this is an important point. I'm going to have to go at 45 seconds per year. My job today is to do the, my job today is to do the talking, and, and yours is to do the listening. Now, we're going to get along beautifully as long as you don't finish before I do. <laughs> I loved it when she laughed. That was wonderful. I've added three other elements to this. There are three elements uh, that are, are solar events. Uh, first one is in 1941, the next one is 1960, and one was more recently. And these are known as uh, GLEs. Uh, that's how people talk about them. It's just an acronym that stands, stands for ground level enhancement. And the one in 1941 was the ground level enhancement of what? And it was cosmic rays. And it was the first time that people recognized that activity on the sun, a major flare, would, would create an enhancement of cosmic rays on the Earth. <laughs> the other reference I'll explain very briefly uh, what I needed to know and learned from the secret teachings of the art of Japanese gardening. And David Slauson is the guy I met at the University of Hawaii at the East-West Center. He was a linguist, a translator, a gardener. He's in, in charge of a big department in the UK uh, in terms of food security, and he is also a, a, a full professor at Imperial College. And he uh, had been interested in the origins of how do you learn things. And this is a, a manual uh, that was written in 1466 by a man named Zoan. And it is how do you teach somebody something when you don't know what you're going to need to know. And so this is a model that I followed. I had a conventional education for 14 years through grade, you know, went to kindergarten, got out of graduate school. And uh, then I spent the next, <laughs> if you will, I spent the next 43 years in the Japanese garden, learning what I needed to know in order to do the, the job I currently had at the time. Okay. So this was uh, Zoen's uh, prescription. There were five principles. The first one was that you could learn by uh, viewing the, the works of masters, past masters. That would be a thing to look at. I mean, look at Da Vinci's painting and see if you can copy that. The second thing is learning from nature. You look around you and see what, how, how a brook runs, and you could maybe mimic that. And this issue was how to take things like stone and water plantings and, and create a piece of art out of it. It's a very esoteric. It has meaning to the people who are involved, and there isn't any particular commercial or economic value at that time for it. So it was a, a, a specialized piece of learning. The third thing you could do secure an apprenticeship where you went and studied with a master and you stayed with him for a while and you learned everything you could from him. And he did this with, with two devices. One of them was just oral transmission. Somebody sits there and tells you about it. Don't open this box until you've 
put the safety in or something like that. And then finally, uh, secret text. Now, there's a need a word of explanation about secret text. Slauson says that that is a, a translation of a, liter a literal translation of the word, but it really means unavailable. And an example of availability is that the text itself by Zoan is, is 11 inches high and 33 feet long. It's a big scroll. So you don't sit down and flip through it or put it on screens on your sequential screens on your uh, laptop or anything like that. And the second thing is you have to be able to read. And not everybody had that ability at that time universally over it. So rather than secret, we could call it uh, you have to deal with unavailable or limited availability information. Now, I hope that I've given enough explanation for that. And I'm going to set the scene for the bulk of my talk. These are uh, six uh, posters that were produced and issued in 1958. They were drawn by a famous illustrator named Herbert Danska. And the National Academy of Sciences put these out. And they, in, in a kind of a way, they sort of parodied the ideas of, uh, from the Greek world about what constituted nature. And it was earth, air, fire, and water. And, and so he shows the parallel of, um, of the earth, the oceans, the poles, and uh, weather and climate. And uh, sort of continuing that theme, Danska uh, superimposed on each of them a little figure from Greek mythology. This is Boreas, who's uh, coming out of the north. He was one of the titans who was in charge of a wind. And, and the other guys you probably recognize. Now, there are two differences in these posters. One of them has to do with space. And in 1957, the first artificial satellite was, was launched. It was a tremendously stimulating event. Uh, the world was very excited. It was defended even the following sense. People measure time from before there were artificial satellites and after there were artificial satellites. So that's, that's a, the measure of a definitive event. And, um, they didn't have anything to show on the poster. What are they going to show? So they just showed a human hand grasping up into the blackness. And so you think about that when you come to work every day. We're still grasping, still grasping. And then there was the, uh, the sun and the earth. Now, the people who devised the IGY as an international collaboration were partially responding to uh, political, social, and moral questions that science had had to confront during the Second World War. And there was also a growing recognition that some things were systems of systems, and it took a different kind of approach to solve those. <clears throat> and the guy that I identify uh, after a little few minutes on the internet is this is probably Prometheus, who was a, a kind of a renegade. And he, he swiped fire from the, the king of the gods, uh, Jove, and brought it to humans. And he was duly punished appropriately for that. But it took us out of uh, eating raw food and, and sitting in the dark all night. And um, this is, he, Danska used a round or globular image to kind of, kind of draw everybody into the whole, the whole thing, frame of mind. And in this one, this is an actual copy of a drawing made by uh, Joseph Shiner. It refers to the rotation of a sunspot in in November of 1633. And what it is is a superposition of daily drawings taken at noon. And you can see the sunspot drifting across the sun. So this is what, what I found was sort of intriguing about these when I was a youngster. <clears throat> now we begin to the part where this is my space story. And I have to question you. I'm going to bring this to you as narrative. So whenever you have history presented to you as narrative, like flying stories or sailing stories or fishing stories or you know stories like that it's always from one viewpoint and so if somebody else had been there which you hope you stay away from that topic they might have seen it differently so i'm going to give you history as narrative and this is where my space story starts you need to be forewarned that the difference between space stories and fairy tales is the following space stories always begin you aren't going to believe this I was standing there in Chris's office, and he says to me, he says, and then it goes on from there. The fairy tales are a little bit different. They always start out, once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> but after that, they're essentially identical. So I, I'll, I'll question you that way. Now, this is what got me started. On the 10th 
of November 1960, I was trying to remove an incomplete from my record. I had had a physics practicum that I hadn't finished the uh, semester before, and I needed to finish it off. And I refurbished a little telescope and I made a camera. And at noon, I got one, one picture and I developed it. And lo and behold, to my surprise, because you couldn't look through this thing in a solar telescope, it had a nice sunspot sitting there approximately in focus. And I thought, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this to finish the project. So I hustled around for a little bit and came up with a measurement of its diameter. It's about 40,000 kilometers across. Now, if you're watching the internet last week, there was a big sunspot that was about that size. And um, it's something that happens every once in a while. And I should say, by the Maunder butterfly, by the way, uh, I was just using that as a clock. Whenever you have a physicist and they see repetitive things, like a pendulum or a quartz crystal oscillating, they'll try and use it as a clock. So I, this, I have seven ticks on the solar clock. That's, that's, the only, that's the illusion. Now, there were some things I didn't know. I'm going to give you the space weather briefing first. Space weather briefing is as follows. This is the peak of solar cycle 19, the 19th one since they started counting. And this is the sunspot number, the integrated sunspot number over the sun. And it rose to a maximum in 1958, which was what people had hoped for in the IGY. And this was two years later, and there was a big flare on the descending phase of the, of the solar cycle. Now, there's some stuff that was unavailable to me. It wasn't secret knowledge. It was just unavailable to me. Uh, in the morning of the 12th, before there was sunrise in Iowa where I was living, uh, there was a great big flare. And I have to, have to kind of remind people that at those days, uh, the major way of keeping track of the sun was not on, the, not on your desktop or <laughs> web or anything. They, they took a picture a day every so often with a, a, a chromospheric camera that got the major features of the sun. And this is one made in H-alpha. It was made off to the east of us in, uh, uh, before sunrise in Iowa. And flares in those days came in what you might call a Goldilocks um, classification. There were little bitty bright ones, and those were called class one. And then there were nice, pleasant, you could kind of deal with them, medium-sized, pretty bright flares, and those were called class two. And then there were great big ugly suckers that covered a big fraction of the disk, and they were bright as could be. And this one was immediately seen as a class three plus. That was the best we could do. There was other knowledge I didn't know about. Um, for the IGY, a uh, professor at the University of Chicago, uh, Simpson was his name, put out 18 uh, things that were called neutron monitors. They were essentially a way of looking at the cosmic ray flux incident on the Earth. And these had operated through the IGY, and they were still operating in 1960. And some of them still operate today. And um, what happened was that a couple of hours after the, after the flare, there was a 200% increase in the cosmic ray flux incident at ground level on the Earth. And it was recognized as, as ground level event number 10. Uh, there were some other things I hadn't realized at the time, and it was about a decade later, about 1970, that I found out that there a chap from, from this center, from our center here, um, Keith Ogilvie, had been in Fort Churchill uh, on, on those days and had launched a sounding rocket up into auroral altitudes and it made a detection of an increase of a factor of three orders of magnitude in protons at the uh, auroral height. Now, where these came from and, and what their fate was, uh, that was an open question. But I want to call this out as an ST observation. It means it's the first, or it could be the biggest or the last or anything. But, but ST measurements have, have a special place in my story. Now, I'm going to try to show you a picture of what I look like along the way. And this is with my, my buddies on the cross-country team at this little Iowa college that I went to. But what happened was, with the knowledge that there had been a big sunspot a few days before, and listening to the, uh, the, the television news, uh, we were kind of alerted that there may be the possibility for a big auroral display on the night of the, uh, on the, night of the 12th, uh, 13th. And uh, on the 13th, 14th, and 15th, there was one of the biggest displays of aurora of, of, the, of the 20th century. And the aurora came way down over, over, uh, way down over Iowa and, and clear to the Texas border. And um, I tried to, tried to understand this. It was just a really interesting thing to look at. And I stood outside for a few hours. And um, 
I tried to debrief about it. I kept a little leather, leather calendar. Everybody has one of these. And you put your dates and your exams and your when school's out and things like that and try and keep track of stuff. And what I wrote was 15 February, November 60, third night of huge rural curtains brighter than, uh, than Delta Orionis and Alpha Orionis was seen through it along with Alpha CM. Now, in Iowa as a kid, I thought this was astronomer talk. So that's, that's why I used those. I didn't know any better. What did I know? And watched from 9 to 11 p.m. And that was Iowa talk because you, you could tell the difference between day and night if it had a.m. or p.m. in it. And uh, it was cold, and I watched for two hours on the last night. And I wrote a single phrase, which was my only analysis about this, uh, which was, uh, I have to know more about this. And that became a kind of a, a, a mantra, a kind of a thing that went through my head like a popular song that you can't get rid of for about 56 years. <laughs> Back to Danska's poster. Have to know more about this. Well, I was extremely stimulated. I woke up and um, I thought, I, have, I do have to know more about this. What, what has happened to me? And what happened, I believe, was that I had gotten pa partially verbal and pos partially nonverbal information that I was embedded in a system that was much bigger than I thought it was. And I thought, well, I just, I really don't understand this. I need to know more about it. Um, <clears throat> now, in Danska's poster, there are call-outs, and there was a little brochure that went along with this. And these are just regions. Nobody knew enough to draw a, even a very good cartoon. And you think about it, the solar wind wasn't discovered for two years from after, after Danska uh, produced this. But there were uh, 10 little inset pictures, and these were mainly IGY assets that were located around Boulder, Colorado. And so this was, in a way, a kind of a recruiting poster that had been organized by a man named Walter Roberts, uh, who was the head of the High Altitude Observatory. And I, I stepped right in. I, I, I'll join up. I'm, I'm your man. So I finished school as quickly as I could, and the next fall I started with Walt at the University of Colorado. <coughs> Excuse me and um, began, began studies. And they were very generous at that time. It was uh, post uh, Sputnik. They were, had a good fellowship, which I had to do some work for. And um, uh, uh, I had started school that, that September. And in four months, I was notified I needed to submit my materials for an annual review. Well, this is kind of a little lesson about graduate school. I can see Jim smiling about this. It's about what you'd expect from a graduate school. And the instruction from Walter was, on 300 words on one page, one side of a piece of uh, paper that was headed for uh, recycle, write down what you've done and then answer two questions, what you've done for the last year, and make an assumption that you're going to be 100% successful and answer two questions. The first one was, uh, who will benefit from your effort? And the second one was, uh, uh, what will be the significance of it? I think I inverted those, but those are the, one, the questions. And I came to think of this as the Roberts test. And I, I'm showing it here as one of the first lessons I learned in astronomy, is that you have to have a way of assessing priority so you don't waste your time. I mean, you can hear a telephone ring, and that's got a high priority because it's urgent. And you answer it, and it's a telemarketer. Or uh, it may be that you need to get another breath of air, because you have to have a certain amount of that to keep going. And that's vital. So it's a way that I used of making uh, urgent and vital discrimination in science and in my life uh, for, for the rest of my life. And when I was down at headquarters, I, I was listening to some people giving their summary pitch for a proposal. And it kept getting in my head, so what? Who cares? And, and my boss asked me, what, what are you thinking about? Your, your wheels are grinding. I said, well, it, you know, they're telling us all this stuff. And I wonder, so what? And who cares? So he glanced onto that because it's kind of insulting to a scientist. You don't want to ever do that because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's demeaning. <laughs> and so uh, I, I hope that this did not go in your write-only memory, but I know it did. <laughs> and um, uh, Ed loved that the rest of his days. He was at headquarters. It's, I was 
the numbers, the numbers are call-outs that went with a little pamphlet. And they were just areas or, or phenomena. It was like ionosphere, aurora, air glow, magnetic field. But no one had any idea how they fit together. Now, there were people around that did. The IGY was started by, uh, by Van Allen, Chapman, and Fred Singer. So these were people who were, who were really interested in the interaction of uh, magnetism with various things. There was a lot of forethought. Well, as a graduate student, like all graduate students, I learned almost nothing about almost everything. <laughs> and I finished needing some education. So what I did was I thought, all I want to do is I want to go to a place that's starting up, because they'll have a lot of new problems that'll be interesting. They'll be right on the cutting edge, no heritage, no backlog of stuff. And I went out to the University of Hawaii and joined the Institute for Astronomy. I was their fifth employee. And what I did, since I had a major at, uh, <laughs> at CU, if you will, in uh, eclipses, chronographs, and mountaineering, uh, I, I got a job doing site surveys on the Hawaiian volcanoes for the big telescopes and building a chronograph on Haleakala. And I practiced there for about five years. And this is the first picture that I ever got through a chronograph that I made myself. And um, what you can see is a big event on the sun. This is a, something that was called in those days an erupt EPL, an eruptive prominence of the limb. We could not see the disk behind this, so I didn't know what it was associated with exactly. And um, the thing about it was that the equipment had worked, so I was overjoyed. I mean, I couldn't believe we'd finally gotten something. And it was the, an image from the, the widest field of view chronograph that had been manufactured that date. It was one of the fastest events ever, ever seen. These fragments are well, well above uh, escape velocity. Uh, they're leaving the sun. Not clear what force is operating there. And uh, finally, uh, uh, it was the biggest event. S, 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 biggest, fastest, biggest field of view, newest stuff in Hawaii. And this is not a lesson, but it's a sidebar in a sense. That the, I found that the PR people at the university and uh, KPOI, the radio station, and KHAN, the NBC uh, 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 television station, they love S stories about science. It's something about the biggest, fastest, most dangerous, bluiest thing, and they just gone through it. Now, this is true today, and I offer this to you just you can remember it so when you see one of those, you know you can call up headquarters and get their interest. After I had been at the University of Hawaii, I followed a path outlined once before. It was I wanted to see the best facilities there were, because I was tired of working on our old stuff at Hawaii. And I wanted to study with the most important people who built those facilities. And at the time, the best I could do was come up with a man named John W. Evans, who had founded the Sacramento Peak Observatory, and uh, Richard B. Dunn, R.B. Dunn, Dick Dunn. Dick Dunn had just finished. Uh, a, 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 a masterpiece. It's a 70 meter vacuum tower telescope. And I practiced with him for a number of years. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to learn how to become a, a serviceable optical engineer. And um, I practiced with him and I cleaned up his messes and I made some of my own. And after a while, I was a serviceable. I don't, I don't, not brilliant. <laughs> we wouldn't use that. But I was a serviceable optical engineer. I could design with a machine, and I could specify with drawings, and I could get stuff manufactured, and I could test it, and so forth and so on. Well, that was my sort of a brief career at Sacramento Peak. But in 1973, the Air Force, who owned the place, made a, a couple of spots available to go on an eclipse expedition to uh, the longest eclipse. See, there's an ST word, right? The longest duration eclipse of the 20th century, and it was just south of the Somali border in northern Kenya, kind of a wild place, and it still is. And um, I snapped that up after thinking about it for four or five seconds, something like that. And something wonderful happened just before we left, which was Skylab was launched. And Skylab was damaged in a launch accident that tore off the micrometeorite shield, and it ruined one of the solar arrays. And when we got to Africa, I remember standing there looking, looking northward at, at dusk, and, and seeing a very brilliant Skylab going over with all kinds of, 200 miles behind it, with all kinds of trash 
rotating and twinkling. And, the, and I thought, boy, this, was, this is bad. I don't think this worked. But we had uh, things like shortwave radio, and I, I learned about the rescue. And I got back, and my boss said, well, look, they found out that this is really kind of labor intensive to run. And they're asking, they asked me if there's anybody here at, at our observatory. I should mention to you, our observatory was 36 miles from Alamogordo, New Mexico. Or the other way of getting there was, was 90 some miles from, from, uh, uh, from El Paso. So it was not an urban center. And the idea of being, being you know, <laughs> remanded to, to Houston for nine months in a real city, after being in Africa, didn't really sound so bad to me. So I thought about that for about 10 milliseconds. And w we went. And I spent nine months there. Now, the center picture is, is back to learning again. I want, to, I want to talk about this. When I got there, I knew nothing about Skylab. I knew nothing about manned space flight. I knew nothing about flight control. So what they did was took me very carefully and grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and dropped me into the flight control rotation. So I sat with a controller and watched how he did and what he did for about two weeks. And then they did the same thing. And this is the ATM simulator. ATM is the Apollo telescope mount. It was a very sophisticated uh, six instrument uh, solar observatory that was attached to the orbital workshop. <clears throat> and um, uh, nobody had ever seen one or had one before, so it was operated by humans like an observatory. And um, I, I sat behind the next flight crew, and I didn't sit here. This is the, this is the simulator for the ATM. It was built into uh, their training facilities. And I'd sit behind him on a little stool that was upright, and I'd look at the plans that were submitted, and I'd look at what he did, and I gradually began to understand how you operated the observatory on a space station. Then I could participate in things. I want to call your attention, by the way, to this picture. It's the picture that came out of Africa. Uh, it's, a, it's the solar eclipse. These are made by scattering of photospheric light off electrons in the upper atmosphere. And uh, this one has had the radio, I'm going to say the words. Please don't worry if you don't understand them, because I'm not sure I understand them. It's had the radial gradients suppressed, so you can see the structures. And this was kind of a first at the time. Well, I was very stimulated. I became convinced that to make progress in coronal research, we're going to have to have access to space that the high temperature, uh, highly ionized ions of the corona that radiate uh, in the EUV were just the thing that you needed to study if you couldn't, if you couldn't have yourself an X-ray telescope. And the idea of having 24-7, uh, uh, which was not possible, but we had very long periods because of the inclination of Skylab, where we'd have 15, 17 hours, you could see the activity in the corona much more clearly. So this, again, just for reference, is the 1973 eclipse picture. This is one that came down on video about two months after I had arrived in, in Houston. And it shows something that I had never seen before, which is a great big chunk of stuff coming off the limb. And then we fumbled with names for a while, like GLE. There was no name for that at the time. And it was finally sort of the, the literature settled on um, CME for coronal mass ejection. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be wonderful if you could have a picture like this every day of the year. And lo and behold, right at the time when I thought I needed a job pretty bad, the High Altitude Observatory said, would anybody be interested in trying to build a ground-based facility that could take an eclipse picture any time the, the sky was clear? And I thought, I, I could do that. So I got a nice job there, and I worked for a number of years building a, an instrument that we emplaced in, uh, in, in Hawaii. And it was a place I had never site surveyed before, but there are advantages to it. Uh, on, the, uh, <laughs> on the active volcano, Mauna Loa, and um, now any clear day, on any clear day, you can essentially get an eclipse picture that looks like this. That's, this instrument's operated since... Uh, 16 February 1980, uh, or a version of it, a sequential version of it is operated. So I thought that was OK. I thought it was very good. Now, as I said, I was pretty sure that we were going to have to go in space to make progress on this kind of, in this field. <clears throat> so I, in 1990, I was, I was, uh, I, I had a, an opportunity to come to Goddard 
And it was not as an optical engineer and it was not as a research scientist. It was as a, a manager of science, as a branch chief. And I had, at the time, been working on a rocket payload, which was similar to the Skylab payload. And uh, my institution wasn't confident they were going to finish it on their own, so they let me bring it with me. And I'm going to show two of the several projects I worked on at Goddard for just summary purposes. This is graduation day on, for Trace, which was a small explorer. And uh, I think maybe, Joe, you're in that picture, probably somewhere in there. I, I marked myself. And my part was so big, you can't even tell where I was in this thing. It, was, it takes a lot of people and a lot of skills to produce a space, uh, a space adventure. And the outcome of it was that it was about the same step for solar physics that uh, the Hubble was for uh, ordinary astronomy. The, the, this is an image that was made where the pixel size is a half arc second. That's 730 kilometers on the sun. And uh, so we begin to learn more about the texture and the nature of the magnetically controlled high temperature atmosphere. This is made in a line that's about a million and a half degrees. Um, the other project was the Spartan 201. And this is not a graduation day. This is a, a pause in the action. And that's the flight control team for the Spartan 201. Um, uh, these people I worked with for off and on since the time of Skylab. So it was a long duration project. We were in a room in, in Houston, not very far from where we used to be in Skylab. And the, the controlling uh, of the spacecraft was limited. It was a robot that we put outside with our instruments in it. And it autonomously recorded its own data and it uh, uh, was then recovered, launched on a space shovel and then recovered. Uh, by the flight crew and brought back to Earth for refurb rehab. Now, I learned something during this, and I hope everybody can hear this in the correct spirit. We talked about, about secret texts, but there are also, in any institution, there are secret values. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a metaphor for you. Your own son or daughter, little Algernon or Bathsheba, is going to start working here at the center next week. And you know that there's something they don't know. And there isn't any way that they're going to be able to learn this except by experience. But they'd really be better off to know it. And it's sort of like handing your, your keys to your firstborn for the car for the first time. You know, let me tell you something, whatever you're going to say. And uh, there was a value which I had not learned because I'd been in the NSF world of management. The NSF world of management. Uh, is done by grants, and there is no deliverable. You get a truckload of money drives up, and then good luck, and two years later, you either have an instrument or you don't. And if you don't, you get to work on it another year or the rest of your life or whatever. And maybe it makes science, and maybe it doesn't. And that's because the NSF was set up to support American universities. But, but NASA has a different mission and a different organization. And every NASA activity, there is a definitive moment. And you can measure time before that moment, and you can measure time after that moment. But the issue of success only comes after that moment. And that's when it's launched, because you ain't going to get your hands on it again. So what would be the secret value of Goddard? Well, I thought you probably put on a, they ought to have this over, if they had a big arch over the gate, it ought to be on the arch so you could look up in the morning and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember now. And I learned it from a guy named Jim Moore, who was the head of engineering. And he was, he, was, he was not being silly when he told me this. The value is it's got to work. If you're going to use national treasure and, and human lifetime assets, you know, you've got to take it seriously. You've got to be doing things that will make the mission work and, and not doing things that will not make the mission work. And everybody works at that real hard all the time in this area. And I think it gives NASA a special kind of, of bonding. And the people I showed you in those pictures, to me, have a special relationship, which is, is in some ways different than a family, in some ways similar, and in some ways it can be much more intense. And, and it's very long lasting. Well, this, this little value can be uh, sort of decomposed into a simple thing, like you tell your kindergartner, look left before you cross the street. And this is a great one-liner, and it helps the kids and everything, except if you're in London, and then you want to maybe modify your. 
So there's, there's a little aphorism like this, test as you fly and fly as you test. And I use this for all kinds in my life, motorcycles, horses, uh, everything. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good rule. And uh, of course there's a limitation to it. With infinite resources, you can remove in, infinite risk, but it'll be a long time down there. In 1990, I began working for a chap named George Withrow, who was the director of the Sun Earth Convictions Division. And George um, and I had uh, been friends and had known of each other for many years. We actually ran against each other in the uh, 1960 uh, Small College Cross Country Championship meet in Wheaton, Illinois. And didn't know that until we started comparing running stories, now this is narrative history, uh, one night at Houston. And George, uh, George and I both bought into the idea that the problem with our science was that there was studying in such a piecemeal way. There was the ionosphere, there was the magnetosphere, there was this, there was that, there was the other, there was solar physics. And it was quite diffused. And he liked the idea of a, of a, of a, a bringing together. And I thought that was a good idea also because I'd gone to the astrogeophysics department. Now, I'm looking here and everybody's been very kind and nobody snickered when I said that. But most of the times, well, there's a, there's a veteran back there, and he's burst into laughter. Nobody believes that name. It's not a useful name. And uh, uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But what are you about in life? What are you about? Can you say, do, can you perform the Walt Roberts test quickly with the 19 seconds that it takes to get from the zero floor to the third floor? while the administrator's on the elevator. And I thought we needed a, a strategic declaration about what our science was about in the Sun-Earth Connections Division. And so this is an example of a strategic declaration. It comes in two parts. The first part is incontrovertibly true. Now you can hear these all the time, particularly this year as an election year. Taxes are just too damn high. You know, really? <laughs> I never heard that before. And then there's the second part, which is a, a matter of um, what are you going to do about this? What, 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 what steps will it be ameliorating and what are, you, what are your thoughts about a plan? So what I came up with in, 19, uh, in 1989, sorry, 1998, was at the center of our solar system, there is a magnetic variable star and it drives the Earth and the planets of the solar system and its sculptures space itself. Research into the system has had results of both cultural and intellectual value. And there have been, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and there have been both political and economic value results uh, for life and society on the earth. There you are. Uh, have a nice day, Mr. Golden. And, and he was very supportive, by the way. Don't, don't take that as a dismissive mark. Mr. Golden was one of our biggest supporters. What else do you need? Well, here's a theory of science. It's been offered by a man named E.O. Wilson. And he, he hearkened back to a word that was coined at the time of Darwin, consilience. The linking together of principles from different disciplines, especially when forming a comprehensive study. And his belief is that science can, in fact, address the problems of life if you can fuse together things like quantum biology and quantum biology and neurology and entomology and so forth and so on, that there are lessons to be learned from nature. I liked his, I liked his delivery. I read a book of his, uh, and he's, he's had two, uh, two Pulitzer Prizes and three, I think, on the New York Times bestseller list. If this were a class, I would assign the task of going onto the web, getting his, his TED talk, because it's advice to young scientists, and it's, it's, worth its, it's worth the time to listen to it. Finally, we're back to what's in the name. I had a nice advisory committee. There was, it took a lot of unity to, to construct a new division, and the scientific community was very good about forming that, and I had some very bright people telling me what I, they thought I should do, of course. And um, I, I became the director of the Sun Earth Connections Division. And one day, uh, actually it was, a, it was a day at a Chapman conference, uh, George Sisko defined what he thought a consilience could be. 
Heliophysics encompasses environmental science. It's a unique hybrid between meteorology and astrophysics, comprising a body of data and a set of paradigms, uh, general laws that are mostly still undiscovered, specific to magnetized plasmas and neutrals in the heliosphere interacting with themselves and with the gravitating bodies uh, and their atmosphere. Well, what he really said was, real quickly, it's the study of the interaction between the two strong forces, gravity and electromagnetism. And that's where, where, where the rubber hits the road. I had a call after one of these meetings, and it was from uh, Mr. Griffin now. The administrator didn't call me frequency, frequently. <laughs> In fact, I only got one call from any administrator ever. And this was from Mr. Griffin, and he said, the following. Dick, we're having a budget meeting here. We have to go to OMB tomorrow. Give me a name for your division and make sure it ends with physics. <laughs> and I need this right now, right now. But if you're at a loss, call me back in 10 minutes because we're ready to go. So uh, if anybody ever wondered why it's called heliophysics, I think I've tried to explain <laughs> that. I learned one other thing that was, was was vital in the sense that it was required to sustain life. And I got this from a, a military historian, John Keegan, who was a professor at Sandhurst. And I heard him talk uh, on a mall one day. I had to do a lot of external learning as a government executive. I was not prepared for that. I shunned courses like, I don't know what, sociology, uh, economics. I, I, that was all bore as far as I was concerned. And here I was, I had to do it for a living. So um, what Keegan said was that for any enterprise, uh, the strategic issues are the following. There has to be a noble, robust goal. So let me give you an example. By the year 2030, we want every child on this planet to have access to four liters of clean water per day. Is there anybody against that? I mean, let's see your hands here. Who's, who's against that? And it's going to last until it happens, whenever that is, whether it's 2030 or 2050 or never. There has to be an available resource, because if there isn't an available resource, you're just whistling. You're just, you're just daydreaming. And finally, um, there has to be a political will within the entity that you're embedded in to achieve this. And I took a lot of other information, attempting to come up with a strategic management theory for SMD or with at least heliophysics. And that my principal instructors were not only Keegan, but a woman named Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first uh, woman to ever earn a Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, a chap named Howard Bowen, uh, who uh, was an economist, who was also a three-time university professor. Uh, I got a lot from Diane Vaughn, and I actually had a chance to talk with her for an afternoon once. She is a sociologist that studies organizations and produced a brilliant uh, exposition of the uh, Challenger launch accident. And later, uh, I, I began to study something that is now conventionally called complexity. It's, it's related to chaos and sometimes referred to as the constructional law of design. And it's where you have multiple agents. They have feedback loops and dependencies that you can't, aren't fully aware of. And it has the capacity, a system that has the capacity for self-organization and is sensitive to initial conditions. So we're talking things like stock market, US government, world economy, so forth and so on. Because that's, that's, that's the regime that we, that's, that's what we're embedded in. This is, this is like the same light going on saying, gee, we're in a bigger system than I thought. OK. After 10 years, this is what happened. This is a, a course of time starting about 2000. This is a, a conceptual sun shown in 304 as a chromospheric line. This is the Earth shown in, <laughs> in blue <laughs> that has uh, magnetic field lines off of it and a kind of a cartoon of the Earth's uh, magnetosphere. And on it is a yellow uh, solar cycle. And they're trying to keep time with the solar cycle once again. And the little dots and the squares and the triangles are missions that NASA has organized to support the consilience of um, of heliophysics. Now there are three on there that are out of the planetary division and the reason they are is that they appeared in an early roadmap, uh, an early uh, decadal survey for, uh, for the Sun-Earth connections. 
but they have in fact been carried out and they have to do with planetary magnetospheres and ionospheres. So the idea had more use for it, I mean the idea of a consilience spread to other kinds of things. <clears throat> On the, uh, at the end of um, 2011, I retired. And uh, this is a picture that sort of, if you couldn't, if I were giving this and I weren't here, this is what I look like. Now, this is taken at the Udvar Hazy Museum. We went to a little evening presentation on human risk and spaceflight. And we're moving down from where they served refreshments down to uh, the auditorium. And the photographer for the museum said, could you step out on a little balcony and we'll take your picture? And I went, duh, OK. And we, we got our picture taken. This is in the McDonald Hall of Spaceflight. We're looking down at the floor of the hangar. And um, I can't give you an ST picture that I participated in. What I can show you is the onlyest picture of its kind known to mankind. This is a Goddard principal investigator. Here is his five times flown spacecraft with the five times flown instruments. Three of those times they were delivered on the launch vehicle, which is nearby. And um, uh, these are all all reusable, stored in flight condition, multi-mission, high mileage articles available for viewing any day of the week. In fact, I'd undertaken four separate educational activities. They usually took about nine years. Solar physics, optical engineering, project management in two institutions, and finally as a government executive. I spent about 14 years in conventional school and about 43 years in the Japanese garden. Fast forward, it's 2012, I'm out of work. I decided I would use the fleet to study the major activity of uh, the 24th solar maximum. And so here is the space, here's the space situational awareness briefing. The 23rd uh, sunspot maximum occurred back over here about 2004 and uh, came to a minimum around 2010 and rose to a maximum somewhere, somewhere in here. And it was kind of a fuzzy maximum. In, uh, at the 1st of January uh, 2011 till uh, November of uh, 2014, the following things occurred. Uh, the, the evolved fleet that I showed you just before uh, allowed continuous, simultaneous, multi-viewpoint, remote and in-situ in observation of the sun. Never happened before. Resi, Fermi, and AMS AMS-02 provided high energy uh, data, which I was unaware of. Now there's another, another flight in here, Pamela, which I've just become aware of lately, which also adds to it. And then there are a number of spacecraft that were at, at sites and places which we'd never had spacecraft before. So what do we find? Well, I used uh, these for my little study. Uh, I did it every day faithfully and downloaded the data. And this is looking down on the solar system. This is the north pole of the sun, and here is the Earth. And east of the, east of the sun is stereo B, and west of the sun is stereo A. So this is starting to sound like a fairy tale, east of the sun, west of the sun. Yeah. And at the L1 point, there was Soho, Wind, Ace. And then around the Earth, in um, high geosynchronous altitude, was SDO and GOES. And then there are three other low Earth orbiting uh, satellites, which uh, were uh, Resi, Fermi, and and AMSO2. And with this, I wanted to take a quick look. I wanted to understand the global nature of, emit, of solar eruptive uh, activity. So a comment. This is AMSO2. Uh, I'm, I was grateful my introduction uh, chap who showed me this uh, is um, from Hawaii and is working with me this summer, Brian Yamashiro. And uh, we found a number, of, um, a number of, of proton events. And these are now referred to as, as solar, solar particle events. So every GLE is a solar particle event. Not every solar particle event hits the Earth, so, and, and for a variety of reasons. So we could find 21 of these at the time. We finally found 25. There's another phenomenon which I was unfamiliar with, uh, and I first saw, first saw one in 2012, and it's called a large-scale coronal propagating front. Now, I'm going to try to show this. There are two images here. One of them is taken 
from SDO. So this, this is the Sun Earth line right at the center here, and SDO. And this is from Stereo A, so it's looking back from, from the west at the surface. And here's an active region right about here, and it'll show up over here because uh, we're, we're, we're a third of the way around the sun. Now let's see if this is going to go. Okay, we're, we, didn't, we didn't do so good on that. I'm going to try this again. Okay, hold up there, buddy. There we go. So I'll show this frame by frame. You can see where the, um, where the loops are in the left image. That's where the flare occurs. Um, the temporal resolution is about two and a half minutes here. There's a, a flare and there's the propagation of a big spherical wave up over the surface of the sun and it blows out over the surface of the sun. This is thought to be a fast mode magnetohydrodynamic wave. I have not an idea what I, that's what I said and that's what I've been told. And it's super alphanic. It's, it's going faster than the estimated uh, alphane speed in that, in that magnetized atmosphere. This was the 71st uh, ground level event and it's the only one of the current solar cycle. There we go, bang. So that was an interesting phenomenon that we want to incorporate in it. This diagnostic, my wife calls it the green monster. It's made with, uh, it has eight images in it. It is, uh, <clears throat> it uses uh, 10 instruments in three different positions of the sky. So on, on this level is a whole sun. This is like the map we used to look at up at the front of the class in the third grade. It's a Mercator projection. And the, these are the active regions, and, and here is an active region where there's going to be a flare. This is a different line. This is a million and a half degrees. This is 800,000 degrees. These are differences, running differences. So in this picture, you'll see what's different from the, from the previous one. It's a way of spotting changes. And then these are chronograph images of the limb. So the way this movie is going to go is you'll see that there's a, a flare here. You'll see it in the differences more easily. You'll see a large scale propagating uh, coronal front here, and then you can see the eruption of the coronal mass ejection off to the side. And we're able to get these for all 23 events, and in fact, could find several others that had occurred on the back of the sun uh, that were up to 20 hours. This is one day's observations. So this was kind of fun going through these and uh, learning about them. Now, one of the first things we learned was that ordinary uh, coronal mass ejections, like the one I showed you from uh, Skylab, were thought to be sometimes loops, sometimes uh, some other geometrical configuration. These pictures taken simultaneously from three different places in the solar system. And what they show pretty unambiguously is that this, they, there's dimensionality. They have expansion rates, which are the same latitudinally, longitudinally, and radially. Uh, and so in some sense, the model that applies is a sphere expanding. And if you haven't seen this before, these are protons hitting the detector at Soho. There's another interesting effect, which I won't go into, which is that there is a phenomenon which is recorded and has been recorded for years, uh, which is a microwave burst. And they start at, at, at one megahertz and they drift downwards to about 10 kilohertz. So if you could listen to it, you go like that. And at that, low, uh, at that low frequency, meaning that it's relatively high in the atmosphere, uh, it's thought that the, uh, the radiation is coming from uh, electrons which have been stimulated with a shock wave. And we found an interesting thing, that every solar particle event has a type three radio burst with this L-shaped configuration. And rather than being 20 minutes long, which is the book value, they're, they're of the order of two or three hours long. So that was, now I'm going to tell you what I learned. What I learned was that if you plot these on the disk of the sun, these are the 25 SEP events, they occur in the mid-latitudes where there's, there's magnetic activity and magnetic evolution. The one red dot there is the ground level event, ground level 71, ground level event 71. And in terms of viewing, uh, the limb of the sun as seen from the Earth is right here on plus 90 and minus 90 is the, is the east limb. And you can see very clearly that there's a westward bias. And this tells you immediately that the large scale magnetic field of the sun is influencing the proton flux as it's emitted. And this is, this is something that was known relatively early but never confirmed for all events. 
So here's the deal. All EUV flares detected uh, are associated with uh, uh, CEP events. Uh, all CEP events generated a large-scale coronal propagating front, an MHD shock. Uh, <clears throat> every, every event had a three-part coronal mass ejection. That means a bright front of an evacuated area and, a, and an eruptive prominence like the one I showed you from Haleakala. Uh, there was a type 3 decimetric burst greater than two and a half hours, and that's a necessary and sufficient condition in this data context. How they are related re is, is, in my mind, not entirely clear. But if you detect one, you know for sure you've got the other. And finally, uh, and I think this is observational selection, 90% of these halo CMEs appear to be enveloped by a preceding, a preceding large-scale shock. And there's the Western bias. Well, that brings me to the end of my career, basically. But I want to have a reflection about impermanence. This is dear old Prometheus making his bad layup shot again while he holds his earth in the right hand. And um, I want to say that everything in this cartoon, which is inaccurate, is insufficient. We didn't have a clue at that time what a model was, a descriptive model might be. I also want to point out that the, the facilities that I found so interesting and drew me so hard towards the University of Colorado have all vanished off the face of the earth. They're all obsolete. They've all been dismantled. They're all gone back to the scrap pile. All the people in the pictures are gone. <clears throat> the astrogeophysics department has morphed into something else. Astrogeophysics, if you look it up, uh, is uh, defined as the geophysics dealing with material found in space, uh, the surface and internal properties of celestial bodies. Now, I don't mention electromagnetism anywhere. However, the impulse for understanding of this kind of system and the system's dissection and approach, the consilience, persists and is alive and well and is very active in NASA. How could that be? And it brings me to my last lesson, which you may be able to use. Why is it that we can maintain this kind of focus and continuity for so long? And I believe there are three, uh, there are three in ingredients and a condition. The ingredients are that something about the activity builds a cohesion. Uh, I depend on Jim, and Jim depends on me. We just see each other in the hall. But I feel funny if I don't see Jim. And there is a, a kind of cohesion that goes through the entire organization at all levels, three guys working on a rocket, four people working on a little satellite, 20 people working on uh, the thermal test for the SMEX, uh, 50 people in a SMEX project group, 1,000 people working on JWST, 20,000 people trying to make space an important ingredient for our government. There is an ethically consistent leadership. Now, before you snicker, I, I didn't say they were morally correct <laughs> or anything like that. Ethics are written rules that govern conduct. And um, this is what I learned from Diane Vaughn, that we have one of the most ethical organizations there is. Did you ever go to a review for a proposal? I mean, there are so many requirements. There is a whole, there's a whole book of them. In fact, it's secret knowledge. It's a secret text, 7120.5. You, 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 yeah, you have to master it before you're really able to play very well. And I didn't take anything about 7125 in, in school, and I don't think I'm... I'm reasonably confident that most people don't. So you have to be in the context to get it. And finally, there's the issue of education. No one would have let me go off and have three or four apprenticeships if I'd had to, if I'd had to focus full time on, a, on a, a single professional job. It wouldn't have been economically possible. But in the NASA environment, they made an arrangement where I could practice some trade that was valuable and learn the next one that I thought I needed to know. And this happens, these three conditions happen in NASA at all levels, in all group sizes, and it happens all the time. And I think we're extremely fortunate for that. Back to uh, Mr. Prometheus for just one second. My reaction to GLE-10 56 years ago was a shift in my consciousness. It was an appreciation of a reality that had previously not been integrated to me in my mind and wasn't available to me. And the culmination of that realization was the recognition of a oneness inside a much larger system, perhaps in the universe. Have to know more about this. 
The behaviors say what you hear, you learn. What you learn, you practice. And what you practice, you become. Well, I became uh, a sometimes scientist, a satisfactory optical engineer, an adequate science manager, and a surviving ex-government executive. Uh, that, was a, that was what happened. There was a cost in time. I was 18 years in conventional Western education and 41 years in the Japanese garden. I aimed at dinosaurs, Egypt, and astronomy. And what I got was uh, heliophysics, Greek mythology, and space. And it was a good deal. Have to know more about this. You notice that there's no pronoun. I didn't say who had to know more about it. And there's no object out here. Uh, because I just couldn't imagine what it was that I needed to know. As I went through my life, I gradually, I repeated this so often it lost meaning. It's an imperative, but it's also, uh, it's also a kind of a prayer and a promise. Have to know more about this. And we do. Are there any questions? Comments, uh, questions? Yeah, Jim. I, I uh, disagree with you on something. Oh, Jim, I'm just astonished. Wait, the shock is so great. Jim and I met. Were you a summer intern or were you a graduate? Sophomore, sophomore, college. sophomore in college. And uh, back in the High Altitude Observatory. And so uh, he's been wherever he's been. I've been wherever. We both wound up here for whatever reason. <laughs> Oh, I don't mind a bit, please. Because, you know, you were commenting uh, about how well all those great facilities you built, they're gone, all the people are, who knows where they are, but that's not quite true. I mean, Mauna Loa Solar Observatory. Mauna Loa isn't in there. Mauna Loa isn't in there. It didn't exist until 1965. But my point is you have a legacy there. It's just doing, doing great. <laughs> I don't know whether it's a legacy or a rap sheet. It's, it's <laughs> You're, you're right. I'm sorry. I, mis I, I misled you a little bit. Those were the, those were the AG uh, assets that were used during the IGY, and, and those are, are, are gone. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, bring up your sense of humor. I think that's an important aspect of your impact. And the other thing I'd like to say for the organizers of this, I would like to encourage you to have this type of presentation by a physics person. In building 21. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, when I came to visit here the last time, I had to sign a little piece of paper that said, number one, I promise, honest to gosh, I won't try to boss nobody. <laughs> Second thing was, I, won't, I promise, honest to goodness, I won't compete with anybody. <laughs> and the last one is, that, that I'd answer all the questions they wanted to ask me. Nobody's ever asked me any questions. So <laughs> I, on the basis of that, I'll go back and ask, could, could I give this talk again in Building 21? As you complete your list of ground-level enhancements, uh, during your retirement period, there was something landed on Mars, and these ground-level enhancements have been measured there as well. So I think on the order of five by now. Well, this is, I, I take your point, and I thank you for bringing that up. I went to a conference, and the first one I've ever gone to uh, on ground level events. <laughs> and I watched a good, brisk argument that just stopped short of a fist fight <laughs> about, about how many ground level events <laughs> have there been. Uh, because the way you count them and the equipment that you use is vital in this. And so uh, I, I sort of expected somebody might, I didn't, I didn't think about Mars. I thought maybe somebody would have brought that topic up. Because you don't know how many ground level events there have been. I don't. I, I took a list from NOAA, and that, that was the best I could. But you're absolutely right. But I think that, but it's interesting. You have to just stop for a second, and I have to expand my thinking to other planets. I mean, we're going to have a situation where we could easily have a section uh, or a, a Chapman conference or something like that, a summer school on planetary magnetospheres. There's enough data now that. You could have something about rotationally driven and uh, uh, solar wind driven and things like that. And, and so it's, uh, it's an interesting field. Okay. Charles, I used up every word I know. I don't know any other words. <laughs> yeah, OK, cool. Uh, last question. Um, what's the most interesting question that you still have that you want to answer? Oh, nice. 
I would like to know what the mechanism is. This, this is the, I think this is searching for mechanisms is what, what this field needs. I'd like to know what the mechanism is with some great certainty for the initiation of a process where you have magnetic energy converted into thermal energy and kinetic energy. I, 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 it still is a mystery to me. I, I know that Brian knows. Brian's been researching this for years, and he has a conference every year, and they're fascinating. But I still don't know what makes the flare. And, and are they deterministic? Could you predict one? That would be the useful thing. OK, let's thank one, one more time.